Welcome to the Resilient Recruit podcast. I'm your host, Leanne Jones-Hunt, and today I have a very special guest joining me to celebrate the 200th episode of the Resilient Recruit podcast, none other than the host himself, Mark Whitby. So Mark is the founder of Recruitment Coach and one of the world's leading coaches for the global recruitment industry. Since 2001, he has trained over 10,000 recruiters in 34 countries. He's helped countless recruiters double or triple their billings in just six to 12 months and business owners grow their companies by 10x. So having worked closely with hundreds of recruiting, staffing and search firms, Mark has unique insight into how the top producing recruiters and fastest growing companies operate. As host of The Resilient Recruiter, Mark has interviewed over 100 owners and directors of successful seven and eight figure firms, keeping his finger on the pulse of what's happening in recruitment. So today, the tables have turned and Mark's in the hot seat to reflect on his own journey and insights from 200 episodes and I'm honoured to be the one interviewing him. Welcome Mark. Hi Leanne, that was fun hearing somebody else do that intro. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I mean we've been talking about doing this for years so uh, what better way to celebrate the 200th episode and we've finally pinned down a date to do this so I'm really excited to uh, have you in the hot seat for a change and uh, uh, ask you some questions that I guess most people who are um, avid listeners listeners of the podcast will also want to know as well um, after following you for a number of years. I'm looking forward to it and in fact um in addition to celebrating 200 episodes, I realized that we're also celebrating four years of the podcast because the first episode was in November 2019. Yeah, so you've come a long way since then. Lots of followers and fans, um, I'm sure. So one of the main questions that you ask all of your guests that I guess I want to ask you as well is what originally inspired you to get into recruitment and what was your journey like in the early, early years? Okay, great question. So uh, in order to answer that question, I need to go back a little bit and tell you that I've started my first business when I was 19 and 20 years old, and I knew nothing about running a business. And it was my first experience in managing people, my first time kind of having to manage, you know, finances. And I worked my ass off like seven days a week during the summer, 80 hours, like seven days a week, 80 hour weeks. And I ended up, it, the business failed, I ended up losing $20,000. So instead of having a summer job where you get paid, I had the opposite. I ended up in debt because of my summer job. And so that was incredibly humbling. I just felt like a total failure at the time. And I, as a consequence, developed some limiting beliefs that really held me back for a long time afterwards. But the couple of things that came out of that that were positives, one was that uh, the only part of the the business that I actually enjoyed and was any good at was selling. So that was a kind of self-discovery because I hadn't ever experienced sales before that. I loved the sales training that was given to me by the franchisor. It was a, a franchise uh, painting and decorating, excuse me, it was a franchise painting and decorating company where I was painting the ex- exterior of people's homes. And so loved the sales training. And that was, of all of the aspects of running a business, that was a part that I kind of naturally gravitated Towards. So that was a positive. That from that point onward, I knew that I wanted to do something involving sales. The other thing it gave me was it, I really had a need to prove something to myself and to almost, I, I probably didn't really need to, but I felt as if I had to prove to my family, to my friends, that I could make something of myself and be successful. So I just was so hungry, Leanne. So then I met this girl from Scotland and decided to, you know, follow her back to the UK and, you know, start my proper career over here. And so I started applying for sales jobs. And a couple of times I didn't realize that the job being advertised was through a recruitment agency. So I'd go along and be interviewed by the recruiter. And I'd never come across this concept of a recruitment agency before. And I was kind of like, huh, that looks like an interesting job. I bet I I think I could do that. And so then I actually saw the job advertised that end up being my first uh, job in recruitment. And I remember the ad said on target earnings of, um, I think it was on target earnings of 45,000 pounds, which at the time seemed like an insane amount of money to me. Like I was, I couldn't almost imagine making that much money. So in 
the exchange rate at the time, it would have been almost a hundred thousand Canadian dollars, which for your first job out of uni, I was like, that is awesome. I'm going to apply for that job. So I end up sending my resume with a cover letter. And in the cover letter, I offered to work for them for two weeks for free to prove that I could do it basically. So they gave me an interview and I, I went through the, the process and that uh, began my first job in recruiting. Amazing. I think a lot of people can resonate as well with that inner hunger and inner drive, especially um, in recruitment. I think that's a trait that I have seen across the years of, of really good recruiters who, you know, just have that entrepreneurial spirit and that just inner desire to want to uh, succeed and, you know, push on. So, yeah, that's all. Totally. Awesome. Um, I, I know parts of that, but I, I suspect as we go through the next hour, I'm going to learn even more about you, Mark. I'm sure of it. <laughs> um, OK, brilliant. So, so we've gotten to the point of starting uh, in a recruitment company. So talk us through that period of time, actually being a recruiter and what you learned in that period of time. Yeah. So um, the the first company I joined, there was no training. It was like, or very little. There was a little bit of shadowing of people and like, but but pretty much you just like, you're in the bullpen and you had to sink or swim and just figure it out by looking at what other people were doing and copying them basically. But unfortunately, a lot of the people around me really weren't very good or didn't know what they were doing either. I did gravitate to a couple of people who seemed to be the most successful, they were billing the most and picked up as much as I could from them. But uh, eventually I was headhunted to work for a bigger firm, had better training and felt started to find my rhythm and feel like I, I knew what I was doing. But I still wasn't really smashing it, Leanne. I wasn't, didn't feel like I was achieving my full potential. I was at a firm with about 200 recruiters and I was, I was working super hard because again, I had that hunger. I really wanted to like prove myself and, you know, make you know, a, a, a good amount of money. And so I was not satisfied with my performance. I was like, from the company's point of view, I was fine because I was literally middle of the leaderboard. I was hitting my targets. So they're like, okay, Mark's fine. Just leave him alone. But I knew that I was capable of so much more that I wasn't demonstrating. I don't know. If, I'm sure there's people listening who can identify with feeling like you're working really hard and, you know, but the results that you're obtaining just don't reflect the amount of time, effort, and blood, sweat, and tears you're, you're putting in, whether you're a recruiter or a business owner. So um, at that point, I decided to hire my own coach. And um, so I was always into learning and development. You know, I went to my first Tony Robbins seminar when I was 18 or 19 and uh, always was listening to like professional development, you know, uh, programs on audio and reading books on sales and that kind of stuff. So I hired this fantastic coach called Ravi Tangri, who actually knew from... Uh, my hometown in Halifax, because he, and a really interesting guy, he had been a nuclear physicist and then became a marketing professor and then became uh, a coach. So just a really, quite an eccentric, but really brilliant guy. Um, and he helped me double my billings in about 90 days. And uh, my, my manager was like, what the heck is going on? Uh, so that was such a transformative experience that it kind of planted the seed later for me to decide to become a coach myself. But so some of the key shifts that I made as a recruiter that really up level my performance are things that we still teach today in this program, Leanne. I don't know, you might not know the origin of them, but one of those was I created a business plan. Two is I analyzed my metrics because my agency really didn't track KPIs or metrics. You pretty much just like, as long as you're making money, they were, they were happy. And of course, the more money you made, the happier they were, but they didn't really give you that um, guidance about breaking that down into the steps required to achieve your goal. So I kind of had to do that for myself, analyze my metrics. I became more and more specialized in a niche, uh, which helped. I moved more up the food chain in terms of the seniority of roles. So going from placing individual contributors to more managers and directors, so therefore higher salaries. I also worked on increasing the the fees that I was charging and end up charging more than virtually everybody else at this agency in terms of a percentage, because uh, the norm in the, in the firm I worked uh, was 20%. And I was like, well, 
why do we only charge 20%? Why don't we charge more than that? And so I just, you know, decided we were going to charge 25% and kind of, so the other huge shift was uh, really looking at the quality of the jobs that I was working and the sort of things I was filling versus the things that I wasn't um, and, and being able to grade those jobs so that I was working on the things that actually I had the biggest chance of being successful with. And the biggest piece of the puzzle, Leanne, was shifting from contingency to retained because I just found contingency recruitment to be so frustrating. One thing I knew is that I was kind of slow at like getting stuff done. And so I would miss out to recruiters who were cutting corners and like, for example, sending the CV to the client without actually telling the candidate that they were doing so, right? And I just felt that was so unfair. Like I was following a correct process and the client would say, oh, we've already got this CV mark. And I'm like, you know, to me, there was something broken with that model where the person who follows a rigorous process is penalized and the cowboy who's just slinging resumes gets the fee. I thought that doesn't make sense to me. So then I realized that there was this whole other world of retained recruitment and found a, a, a mentor who could teach me how to do that. And I, as soon as I realized that, it was like a light bulb going off. And I was like, this is the way forward. And so I really made a huge uh, shift towards retained recruitment and ended up being, out of 200 people, the number two person at winning retained business in the, in the company. And yeah, I mean, everything you said there sounds very familiar, all of the strategies that we teach because the foundations, you know, remain the same and they do um, withstand the, the, the kind of the years. But obviously we are now really evolving with technology and things that are making us even faster. But um, things like market mapping and obviously you were saying about moving up the food chain, like increasing your terms of business, like all of these things we're teaching in the program, even to the most seasoned recruiters who may have been doing this for 25, 30 years it's a really good reminder that you need to get those ducks in a row before um you know for everything to fall into place and it sounds as if like your um that was like your transformative moment in terms of just connecting the dots and just realizing like I could work all the hours but actually it's just working smarter and like thinking about um well we all know if anyone who's a fan of the podcast knows that Mark is evangelical about uh retained and anyone in, in our program knows that as well but with good reason for all of the things that you said there uh, and more. I mean, obviously that's a course that we teach as well um, within the program. And we've had some really successful um, stories of people moving completely from 100% contingent to 100% retained now. So yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. Mm, great. So a um, couple of things that you said that I just made a, a quick note on because I wanted to make sure I, I didn't forget them. Um, so obviously you were saying about how initially you were trained um, as, as Pat uh, you would expect now when you're going into companies. But this is quite common in terms of even in my generation as well, like you were kind of left to your own devices to try to figure it out. You sunk or swam and you, you know, you went through the motions of that. And we do find that with our members as well. So, you know, they're trying to train their newbies to um, come through the ranks, but actually they're doing it off the basis of their own experience as well. So I understand why that happens because especially for small recruiting businesses where the owners are also billing, then it's hard to carve out the time to train the new recruiters whilst also all the other things you're doing when running a business, right? So I get that, but it's that's not an excuse really to make sure that your team members you know, are getting the proper training so that they can achieve their full potential, which is only gonna benefit them as well as you as the owner. So that is one of the reasons why we have created the recruitment mastery blueprint where we basically do the training for the owner. So many people started asking us to, if we could just train their team for them that we decided that we would offer that as a service. So we spun off uh, a, whole, um, a whole course, which is specifically for recruitment consultants. Leanne, do you want to say a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, it's a 12-week program which covers candidate sourcing, business development, and then the actual pl- uh, placement process as well. So um, it's all on Zoom. It's group cohort learning. Um, we've had a group of 13 recently, and it's been a huge success. Um, again, it's filling in those gaps where potentially the recruitment business owner or the manager just it just can't have doesn't have the time to be able to do that. So we're getting we're accelerating that process of that steep learning curve by filling in the blanks and leaning on various AI tools in order to help people um, be kind of in the this this century um, and uh, <laughs> just be able to you know really evolve with what's happening in the AI world as well. And I guess that's been really refreshing for the rookies, because I think when we were trained or not trained um, in recruitment, it's very much there's the phone. Um, And, you know, in my case, even when I started, it was like yellow pages, there's the phone, call through. Um, Whereas now business development can be a massive umbrella term for a lot of different activities. So, um, yeah, that's something that we teach. And it's, um, yeah, it's been really successful so far. So. So people who joined the Recruitment Mastery Blueprint program, the intention of the owners is, well, if I can shorten the learning curve, if I can get them productive faster and start contributing rather than being a cost, you know, quicker, then there's going to be a huge ROI on that. So it's kind of a no brainer uh, and the time saving of not having to do all that training yourself. But what's amazing is that the... Recruitment consultants that Leanne and Julie are training are actually learning things that the business owner doesn't even know. And they're coming back to the business, bringing those strategies and those ideas, like, for example, leveraging AI to enhance processes uh, within the business. And so the things that the recruiters are learning, they're now teaching the business owner. So uh, it's, it's fantastic how that's happening. Yeah, it's great. So let's bring it back to your story then. So okay. you've got to the point where you're really successful now. You've engaged a coach, which has made you, did you say double or triple your billings? Did a you double. So double, you, double yeah. your billings. Yeah. Okay. So talk to us about how the transition happened from recruitment agency to then into the realm of coaching. Yeah. So because of the various experiences that I'd had uh, with learning and development over the years, and especially that experience of having a, a coach and working with that person to level up my performance, um, I sort of reached a point where I realized that I liked recruiting. I was good at it. I wouldn't say I was the best. I wasn't fantastic at it, but I was good at it. Um, I enjoyed. I enjoyed recruiting. But I felt like my true path was going to be more on the learning and development side of things. And that's where I was going to experience the most fulfillment and the most satisfaction. So I just combined those two things and I decided, okay, well, I'll I'll start a training and coaching business, but specifically for the recruiting industry, because then I can apply the things that I've actually learned. and, you know, and also I understood the importance of having a, a niche focus at that stage. So rather than trying to offer sales training in general to any type of company, to me, it just made sense to focus on a specific niche. In this case, it was going to be recruiting companies. So you've been a coach for 22 years now. So talk to me about some of the highs and lows and also um, just some of the things that you've gleaned over the years, if you've seen any changes in the recruitment landscape and just give us some insight because that's obviously a great deal of time to have those observations. Absolutely. So much has changed. Of course, there's fundamentals which will never change, but I'll, yeah, for sure. So much has changed. So when I launched the business in 2001, I was like super excited, also scared, but mostly just excited about starting this business. And um, I built it through cold calling, networking, referrals, like the same same way that I grew my recruiting desk. So it was a lot of cold calling, um, door knocking, putting myself out there, and then winning some good clients and getting repeat business and getting referrals from those clients. So I, for example, would train a group of recruiters and you know, recruiters move around a lot, right? So I've trained recruiters at one company and then they might leave that company and join another one. And then they would mention that they'd been trained by me. And then that new company would be like, oh, who is this guy? Let's see if he can help us to train our staff. So that's the way the business kind of grew organically in the early days. And it was fun, it was exciting. 
But I fell into the classic trap of stopping doing the things that made me successful in the in in the first place. So, you know, when I had that client base and I had the repeat business, then I started getting comfortable with that and I was doing less and less of the business development activity and I was over reliant on a handful of, you know, bigger accounts that would just keep me busy. I was in there almost every week training people. Um which I didn't fully appreciate the huge mistake I had made until the recession in 2008, 2009, where I lost like, I, I, don't, I think it was something like 83% of my revenue just evaporated overnight. So that was super scary because at that point I now had two kids, Lisa was pregnant with number three, had the mortgage, et cetera. And I was like, how am I going to even pay my mortgage? So that experience was horrible, but um, the positive that came out of it was it forced me to really reinvent the business and how I was running things. And in particular, instead of relying just on the old school, you know, sales methods that I learned with just hitting the telephone and going to visit people, the key things that I did differently was really leverage digital marketing and when I had been super busy, I, I kind of was aware I was dabbling with digital marketing, but I hadn't, I had limiting beliefs like, oh, it's too complicated, or I don't have time to really, you know, commit to that or what have you. But suddenly I had time and I also just, I had to figure it out, right? I couldn't see any other way that I was going to develop the number of new clients that I needed as fast as I needed them. So I really doubled down on digital marketing and figured that stuff out. And then that l paved the way for the business ultimately to be even more successful than it had been prior to the recession. And then what happened, Leanne, is clients started asking me for help with digital marketing, which wasn't orig like originally when I was training people, it was how to sell, retain, search, how to do business development, how to negotiate, you know, uh, how to close offers, all that kind of stuff, right? And suddenly people could see what I was doing with marketing, with branding, with email marketing. And they're like, hey, could you help us to do that? Because that's that looks like the way forward, right? And so more and more, I started uh, moving in that direction with helping people to generate inbound leads, for example, and, and, and build their brand in order to have authority in their market. Yeah. So that is a positive to come out of, obviously, the recession. And I think um, that's why we reiterate all the time with our members, you need to be setting aside time to really work on the business and not just in the business, because it can creep up on you in terms of certain things like perhaps you're just doing the daily grind of recruiting and actually not looking at um, the intentional strategic side of things and where you're headed and your business plan and making sure that it's still aligned with what you set out to do. So, um, so yeah, that is that is definitely a positive that you obviously explored the digital marketing side that obviously then opened up a new door in terms of the coaching. So yeah, awesome. So um, what else then, Mark? Because I feel like that's um, obviously 22 years. There's a lot to jump back into that. But um, what else about your 22 years in recruit in coaching would you, uh, what are the, the lessons or the, the challenges that you've experienced over the years? Yeah. Okay. So well, one thing that has been an overarching theme to my whole career is um, seeking mentors, role models, like people who are already successful. Uh, that's an idea I got from Tony Robbins, which is that success leaves clues. And if you find someone who's already achieving brilliant results, and then you can you know, interview them and and elicit their strategy, their mindset, their tactics, their techniques, then you can apply those same, you know, tactics, techniques, mindsets, and improve your own results. So that's something that I've always done. As a recruiter, I did it. And that's how I learned how to sell, retain, search, for example, finding that role model who I could learn from. Uh, and then when I went out into the world to become a, a coach, there's a part of that cha uh, that chapter I forgot to tell you earlier, Liam, which is that I realized that I still knew nothing, right? In the com in my company, I was like in the top fifteen percent of billers, but then 
that was in Scotland, which is a, you know, a small place. And when I started working UK wide and internationally and, and getting exposed to some incredible recruitment companies, like really fast growing businesses with some really top people, really top producers, I realized that, you know, I still had a lot to learn. And so that journey of constant learning, growth, improvement has kind of just always continued. And the amazing thing about being a coach, as you know, is we work with so many amazing, successful people. And this, the learning is two ways, right? Because they are joining our program because they want to learn from us. But at the same time, we learn from each of our clients as well. So because I've been exchanging ideas with you know, brilliant men and women for the last 20 plus years, that's give, that's been a huge privilege and it's giving me like insight into what are the common, you know, factors that contribute to people's success? What are the most effective strategies? And also keeps us really on the cutting edge of what is working right now, not work, work last year or five years ago. Um, so that's been a continuing theme, which has kind of, inspired the launch of the podcast, which I'm sure we'll, we'll come into talking to. But one of the huge learnings for me, Leanne, apart from the um, importance of digital marketing and having... So <clears throat> if I can just expand on that, the challenge with being a solo, rec solo recruiter, and in my case, it was like a solo you know, trainer, like a one-person business, sole proprietor sort of business, is that you're constantly juggling between business development, winning the work, and then delivery, right? And so what the digital marketing and marketing automation allowed is that I could start having a constant flow of leads, even when I was really busy training, coaching, delivering the service, or in the case of our listeners, delivering their recruiting service, filling jobs, is that you still need a constant flow of new opportunities coming into your sales pipeline, right? But even with that, there are such huge limitations to just being a one-person business. And I've come to realize that the number one thing that holds many business people back from achieving their full potential and being as successful as they would like to be is that they're trying to do everything themselves and they're not leveraging the power of other people's talent, time. And um, and so that was one of my learnings as well. When it, I, I realized that even when the business came back and I achieved a new level of success that was more than I had ever experienced before the recession, I was still on a hamster wheel. And, you know, where number one, I had to keep running on that wheel, otherwise the revenue would stop. And number two, as a consequence of that, I could never take a holiday. I couldn't like... And, and it's funny because when people start a business, they often, one of the motivations is they want to make more money. They want to have more autonomy and control. They want more freedom. They want to have a bigger impact. But the reality is, instead of experiencing more freedom, often they experience less, right? And because, you know, people go on holiday and they take their laptop or they're constantly checking their phone, checking their emails. And that was me, which is not sustainable and it's not scalable. So... You know, there came a point where, and I, and I had already taken the step of hiring a virtual assistant. I hired Rachel five years ago in 2018, and that enabled me to level up again. But it's I was still on that hamster wheel, which uh, I think a lot of our our clients come to us because they're on that hamster wheel. They don't see how they can scale their business or make it more sustainable to have that consistent revenue uh, without burning out and. That's something we've directly, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, or it, it, it's 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 almost like they don't know what they don't know. It's like, okay, what would I even delegate to a virtual assistant? And I mm. guess this is where I come in in terms of our program because I run the VA pillar um, in terms of, you know, I've got a whole checklist, everything to do with hiring, managing, training, and onboarding VAs. And it's a game changer. Even when I had my own recruitment business, I had four VAs in the end because um, actually you get really uh, used to and it becomes really apparent that the more you can delegate, the more 
more you can focus on the things that you enjoy, things that are more in within your pay grade, you know, the things you should be focused on, like business development, without worrying about sending interview confirmations or um, doing admin tasks or recurring repetitive tasks that don't require you necessarily to be doing that. So that is, um, yeah, that's been a game changer personally for me with my own recruitment business, but also I'd say 95% of our members have at least one VA, if not more. I'm working on the other 5% at the minute. So <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And yeah. actually that was uh, a revelation as well was, well, two things. Number one is why, why stick with one VA? Why not have a whole virtual team of people who are supporting you to, you know, um, to achieve the, the, the most billings you possibly can whilst also working less. Right. And so that was huge. But the second thing was also overcoming the fear of hiring full-time employees as well as virtual assistants. And so that was a huge step forward in my business land was when you and I joined forces in 2020. And, um, you know, that's, I mentioned at the beginning how the limiting beliefs for my first business failure really held me back because I think that certainly for me, but I, I suspect for a lot of people listening who have are adamant that they're just going to be a solo producer, they don't want employees and so on. It's, it's a limiting belief or it's a fear of, well, what if I hire someone and it doesn't work out? Or what if it's going to increase my cost and then I'm going to have to, you know, it's all that fear and the, the, the fear of the risk. And that really constrained my growth for years. I let that experience of when I was 19 years old kind of um, stop me from p- developing as a leader and as an entrepreneur. So then in 2020, I realized that I did want to scale and I did want to, you know, grow beyond just myself. And I wanted to have a bigger impact, be able to reach more people. Um, but I really didn't know physically how to do that. I didn't know what the steps would look like. And then I uh, came across you and decided and realized that you were exactly the person I needed to help me to get to that next level. And then the very next year uh, after we started working together, then we doubled our revenue. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think it was the same for me wanting to have more of an impact as well. Like in terms of the recruitment industry, I worked in the rec to rec space. So um, yeah, and it kind of was just as when we first started speaking on Zoom, everything was making sense, like my recruitment business owner background, but also I've experienced memberships and being part of programs before. And like notoriously, your background was more one to one coaching when we first met. So it, we had this like massive idea of building out a program. And now we have this fully fledged community um, that spans across the UK, Europe, US. And um, yeah, I mean, people have been with us for over three years since the beginning. So it's been uh, an amazing journey. Um, And I think we've had uh, even in the three years we've worked, well, three and a half years now that we've worked together, there's been even lessons um, and things we've learned along the way just by joining forces. Because like you always say, it's not like one plus one equals two. You know, you you do actually get um, so much more because you've got fresh eyes on your business. You're collaborating with somebody who perhaps has uh, strengths in other areas. So you can really make more of an impact if you do go down the route of hiring. And um, yeah, I mean, for us, it's been a really positive experience in terms of you going from solo and me going from solopreneur to then obviously joining forces. Um, but yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I had no idea what I was missing out on in terms of like, as you say, like one plus one equals three, it, there's like a multiplicate, there's like an exponential impact when you have the right people working together. It's uh, the analogy I would use is, you know, if right now you're in a rowboat rowing by yourself versus you have a whole crew who are rowing in the same, like in the same boat, how much faster you can, uh, you can, you can move, how much further you can get, and also how much more fun it is um, to be with a team all working together in the same direction is, uh, has been amazing. 
Exactly. You just get that momentum and it just keeps ticking. And, you know, it's like the flywheel versus the hamster wheel from what you were saying earlier. And like even to the point of now our members are starting to be intrigued about and actually executing the idea of integrating an ops person because um, they can see the value of that um, versus perhaps a recruiter. It's actually an operations person who needs to um, come in and really look at the systems and the processes that underpin the full recruitment cycle. So that's something that we're working on with our members. Exactly. As well. So that's been really interesting as well to look at different business models and and hybrid models where people like some people have a virtual team, say in the Philippines, and where some people have more of a hybrid. So they have virtual assistants and they have full time employees, and those team members are often, but not necessarily, recruiters. As you say, maybe the mo- the next right hire is an operations person, especially if as the business owner, that's not your forte. And that's what's constraining your growth is that, you know, managing the admin, the back office, all of the moving parts, because scaling a business, there is a lot of moving parts. And if you feel like that's not going to play to your strengths, then why not hire somebody who loves that? And you'd never regret hiring because it does mean now our members are saying to us like, I took a vacation and it's like the first one in 10 years. And like they really right. can switch off because they've got a reliable team who has got it covered. They've got, you know, they've got their back. So, um, but even with the operation stuff, again, that's a, a pillar, a coaching call that I uh, run. And so we are working really closely with our members to make sure that those processes are there so that everybody company wide knows it, whether whether it's virtual team, whether it's two or three people, whether it's, you know, 10 to 15 people. Um, it's a really important part of the, the process that I think is overlooked quite a lot um, with recruitment business. So it's the last thing on the list is like process um, versus like the sales and the marketing and the, you know, the things that are perceived to be more fun, I guess. Um, totally. Great. Well, I think we should move on to talking about the podcast, seeing as this is the 200th episode of The Resilient Recruiter. Um, So let's take it back to when you first started The Resilient Recruiter podcast back in 2018. So what motivated and inspired you to start it? So it was 2019 that I started the podcast. Okay. Yeah. And what inspired me was it's kind of the extension of that theme I mentioned earlier of finding role models, finding people who are really successful, learning as much as I can from them. So I was already having these conversations. It's just that I was having them in private with like my clients, for example, where they would hire me to work with them. But then I would end up asking them tons of questions and like learning a lot from them as well. So all I really did was make those conversations public so that more people could benefit. And so that has been such a rewarding and amazing journey to have had those 200 interviews now or close to 200 interviews because, yeah, I mean, I love learning uh, and uh, I try and I believe that no matter how successful someone is or how experienced they are, I am absolutely certain that they could learn something from me. But likewise, I am I believe I can learn something from everybody who I encounter. So, uh, but the podcast has the podcast has had such an impact on people across the globe. I mean, we know that because we get the feedback, but also we've got members who've uh, in the program who've directly come as a, as a result of listening to a podcast episode. I mean, we've even had a few members who've actually resigned from their jobs and started up their own recruitment businesses as a result of the podcast. So, you are inspiring people out there. Uh, all stages in their recruitment career. So it is having that impact that you set out to um, to have, which is, which is awesome. So something else that I actually wanted to say about the podcast is that, which I hadn't been expecting, is how much of an impact it's had. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing when you have conversations with people and they tell you, they feel like they already know you because they've listened to so many episodes of the podcast, for example. And so that's one of the reasons why we actually teach our own course on how to start and grow a successful podcast. And we've helped, I think, close to a dozen at this stage, uh, recruitment business owners to launch their own podcast because it is such a powerful vehicle for 
um, becoming an authority in your niche, as well as an opportunity for you to have these conversations with leaders in your industry that you serve and make those real connections with people who could be potential clients or their influencers, their potential referral sources in your in your space. So although that wasn't the reason that I set out to do it, it's been a, a very welcome byproduct. And I've also seen as well on the recordings of strategy sessions and people are like quite starstruck when they speak to you because if they've listened to you on their at the gym, on a, a walk with the dog and like week in, week out, they do feel like they get to know you. And it's that know, like and trust factor that we're teaching in the program as well as a, a strategy for, you know, as a recruiter in your space, you want to build that credibility and authority within your niche so that you have the same effect as well. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy how you can become so well known in your industry. And we've seen that with our members as well, when they leverage inbound marketing strategies to build their authority in their niche. And then, for example, they go to a, a conference and people who they don't know come up to them and say like, oh, are you Rebecca Hastings? I've, I've heard your podcast, for example. And, you know, so I love hearing those stories. Yeah, definitely. So what's up next for the podcast? What the what does the future hold for the Resilient Recruiter podcast for 2024? <laughs> Great question. So we are always looking to level up. So we've recently hired a full-time videographer and uh, podcast editor, Sanjay Vyas. And so we now have a full-time team of four of us. So there's you, me, there's Julie McGrath, who is on our coaching team and a very strategic hire for us. And then we've got Sanjay who is going to help us level up our own video because we practice what we preach, right? Everything that we teach. So we have our six pillars of a seven figure recruitment business, but we're doing, you know, all of those six pillars ourselves, right? And so, you know, we're leveling up the quality of the video, uh, expanding our YouTube channel, expanding onto other platforms like Instagram, like TikTok, in addition to, of course, LinkedIn, which is our uh, core platform at the moment, and just then leading the way for our members and, and you know helping them based on what we've learned about how to leverage inbound marketing, how to build your brand, how to become an authority. So we just need to keep improving, and that w paves the way for our clients to, to follow. Plus, in addition to the four of us here in the UK. We also have two awesome team members in the Philippines. We've got Rachel, who most people on this podcast know because she is the manager of the podcast. And secondly, we've got Ryan, who's our lead generation specialist. So that is six full-time people that we have currently. And we have ambitious plans to grow the team even further in 2024 so that we can continue to grow our audience, reach and impact more people and change more lives for the better. So I'm just so grateful for the team that we already have and the opportunities that this podcast has uh, attracted. And I'm just super excited about what we're going to be able to achieve uh, in next year and, and beyond. So looking back over your whole career, even from the age of 19, when you first had the entrepreneurial venture to now, what would you say that you're most proud of? So what I'm most proud of is the results that our clients obtain. It's, a, it's kind of like comparable to, for our listeners, when you make a placement and you really have that impact and you change someone's life for the better, both the candidate, of course, in a, a better opportunity, but then the client company also benefits from that talent that you've, you've brought to them. So the equivalent for us is when we're working with a client and they achieve you know, incredible results, whether it's shifting to retain search, whether it's launching a podcast, whether it's hiring a virtual assistant, and then, you know, that being such a life-changing thing, game-changing to free up all that time and be able to accelerate your, your billing. So, you know, I live for those, you know, success stories when at the beginning of every coaching call, we start out with wins and everyone needs to share a win, something they've made progress on, something they've achieved since we last saw them. That's my favorite part of the of the week is hearing those wins from our members. That's probably the thing I'm I'm most proud of. In addition, it's our own internal team. It's really um, having a, a company that we love that uh, is a vehicle for us to grow and develop as well as 
you know, as professionals as in individuals. Awesome. So how did I do for being the uh, interim Resilient Recruiter podcast host? (laughs) That was brilliant, Leanne. I might, uh, I think we should do more of these where you're the, you're the host. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Brilliant. That was great. Uh, Again, so honored to do that because I'm also a fan of the Resilient Recruiter podcast, even though I'm also an employee (laughs) of Recruitment Coach. Um, But yeah, that has been really fun, Mark. Yeah, we should definitely do it again. Thanks, Leanne. That was great. Thanks, Mark.